Hello everyone, Sebastian Lucido here. Welcome to Line by Line. We're studying the book of Revelations. Today we're going to have a sort of a over orientation overview of the book. And then uh, we may get into the first couple of verses in the book. So, you know, the book uh, itself uh, is the last book of the New Testament. Uh, there are some uh, groups through history that have wanted the book of Revelations excluded uh, from the original uh, uh, New Testament. Uh, however, they failed. Uh, the book was written by John, the Apostle John. Uh, John was the last remaining Apostle of the Lamb alive. It was written in 95 AD, so about 65 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The Apostle John was the youngest Apostle. He was like a little brother to Jesus. We see him sitting on his lap, leaning, it says, leaning against his breast. So he's like a little brother. He was around Jesus all the time. He was on the inner circle. Jesus commissioned on the cross his mother, the caring for his mother, uh, Mary, into John's uh, hands. So John was very respected uh, by Jesus um, and became a prominent leader in the church. Uh, tradition has it that they tried to boil him in oil uh, to try and execute him and martyr him. Uh, tradition has it that he walked away from it. We don't find it in scripture, but that's what tradition says. He was banished to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote the book. The Isle of Patmos is an eight mile long island, about four miles wide. It's just off the coast of Turkey, uh, probably five to 10 miles off modern day Turkey. It was called Asia Minor back then. And so John was in the Isle of Patmos this is where the Romans sent their political prisoners. Um, they were sent there to live out their days uh, in captivity there. And so when you look at the book, it was written uh, by John. And it, it, it's interesting because Jesus appears to him in Revelation chapter 1. And it, John hadn't physically interacted with Jesus uh, I, it may have been the whole 65 years. We're not sure if he physically appeared to him like he did uh, to Paul the Apostle. Uh, so, but 65 years later, uh, Paul, John drops to the ground and he faints at the glorified Christ. And here's the thing we have to keep in mind. This is very important to understanding the Bible and understanding God and his word, is that Jesus is a man. Uh, he is, he is, for eternally, he will be a man. Even though he lived before Bethlehem, he was the son of God. He was actually in the Garden of Eden. Uh, he created, actually, Jesus created all things. Colossians tells us all things were created by him and for him. So, but Jesus is a man. When he took on humanity in Bethlehem, he became a man eternally. And so when the man, the glorified Jesus, the man Jesus, who had been in heaven for 65 years, appears to John. John faints and hits the ground in Revelation chapter 1. And we see Jesus have to physically raise him up. Uh, and, uh, and so we see this, uh, the glorified Christ. And so when we begin to look at the book and understand it, um, lots of times... Uh, it, even even in the early days of Martin Luther, he, he wanted to take the book out of the Bible because it didn't make sense to him. But when you look back at it, it really is a very easy book to understand uh, when, you, when you really uh, read it line by line, as we're going to do. Uh, because all of the Bible was written for the common man. It wasn't written for leadership. It wasn't written for leadership that would decipher and understand it and discern it and then give it in small pieces to laity. The Bible was meant to be our personal guide, every human being's personal guide to God and his expectation and his word. And so the book is, is while it has a lot of symbology, I mean, we'll hear about lampstands and stars and beasts and a, a great harlot. And, and so we'll see all of this symbology or imagery that John has seen. However, if you read on, the, the book always, uh, always reveals itself. So in other words, it'll say the lampstands are churches and the stars are angels. You know, so when we go through the book, 
Uh, we're going to go through it again line by line, verse by verse. Uh, the book will always ultimately lay out its symbology. You know, and the book itself, like end times, is all about Jesus. The entire book of Revelations is about Jesus. It's not about Antichrist. It's not about the false prophet, the great harlot, the seven uh, seals and seven trumpets, seven bowls. It's not about the events. You know, it's not about anybody but Jesus. They are all characters in the final chapters of this dispensation. And so it's all about Jesus. When we look at end times, let's back up from the book of Revelation. Just let's look at the entirety of the Bible. Uh, if we go back in time, the first revolt against God was Satan falling. When Satan fell, a third of the angels fell with him, and the earth became a wilderness. Uh, we see in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28, Satan's fall. We see that the earth becomes a wilderness. Um, eight, a third of the angels fall. That's found in Revelation chapter 12. And so there's also demonic spirits, and so there's a whole group of, of dark spiritual beings led by Satan that go into a type of dormancy for, could be hundreds of millions of years, we don't know. But at some point, God incubates the earth. When he incubates the earth, he restores it. He restores vegetation. He begins to store, restore life on earth, sea life, birds, fowls, and then he creates man. And he creates man in his image, very important. It's the image of a living spirit, an image of a spirit that is attached to God. He creates his body from the dust of the ground and he blows into his nostrils the breath of life and he becomes a living soul. So his soul, our souls, our minds, our will, our intellect, our bodies, are our physical bodies, and our spirit is the real, the real us. It's attached to God it's, it's, it, and it's righteous. Well, when Satan comes into the garden and Satan gets Adam and Eve to fall by tempting them, telling them that there's no consequence to their actions or sins against God, that they can use God's creation the way they want to without regard to God, and that, that God didn't give them enough that they lacked. And so Satan created lack in Adam and Eve <coughs> and caused them to disobey God. When they disobeyed God, they became as gods, knowing good and evil. But here's the thing. They went from a spiritually led, spiritually dominated individual, person, creation, to a physically dominated creation with a dead spirit. They were unrighteous in their relationship with God, and they were separated from him. So prior to the fall, they were the spiritual authority on earth. They were the dominant authority on earth. Adam and Eve had complete authority over all of God's creation. When they fell, they lost that position to Satan. Satan became the dominant spiritual authority on earth. And then Satan became the father of all of Adam and Eve's offspring because all of, his, all of Adam and Eve's offspring were born unrighteous, condemned, spiritually dead, not attached to God, with no relationship with God and needing salvation. So when you look at it, the least that's on the earth, the time period that's on the earth, Satan, even after the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, is still the God of this earth and has tremendous spiritual authority in the earth. After the church age, right, we got, we received salvation, which fixed our relationship with God. We became alive to God. We became uh, righteous in God's eyes. All the condemnation, all of the guilt, all the shame left. So when Adam and Eve fell, not only did they lose their status as the dominant authority, but their souls died as well. They, they had, when we see them having low self-esteem, they had shame, they hid themselves, they were depressed. So all of their being completely fell as a man. And so everybody born after that 
were born like we were, with a mother and father that came from Adam and Eve. And so we were born needing salvation, spiritually dead, our souls were dead, and eventually our bodies were going to die. Satan was the father of us. And so through the new birth, through Jesus, who was born outside of Adam's transgression, because the, the, the sin traveled through the male seed, so he was born outside of a male seed, a fallen male, a dead image male, an unrighteous male. Uh, he was born righteous and holy, and therefore he could be the sacrifice. But he left heaven forever as the Son of God in spirit form. He became a man forever. For eternity, future, Adam will be a man. And so we became, uh, through the new birth, right, we became born again. Our spirits were now alive to God. We were now righteous in God's eyes, yet our souls needed changing. Our souls still had depression and fear, low self-esteem, shame, guilt. We, we grow through the sanctification, the renewing of the mind and life, okay? So from generation to generation, we occupy until Jesus returns. When he was taken up in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, he, he ascended up into heaven, he turned over to the reins to the Holy Spirit and to the church. We occupy generation to generation. On that day, the angels told him, told the, the apostles and disciples that were there, that this same Jesus is going to return in like manner. So when Jesus comes back, he, when he comes back, he's coming back to judge and send to eternal damnation the angels and demonic spirits, all of unrighteous men that never believed in him through history, and banish them to an eternal judgment. Now there's certain other things that happen, but when he, rec when he comes back, in Revelation chapter 19, after we go through the seven trumpets, this, you know, the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls, when he comes back, he locks Satan up in Revelation chapter 20 for a thousand years. He casts Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire, and the, the, the unsaved humans remain in hell at the end of the millennial reign, the thousand years, which now we're in chapter 21 of Revelations. We see that all of hell, the unrighteous, unsaved men and women are cast into uh, the lake of fire. Satan and his angels are cast into the lake of fire. And, and so uh, we have a new heaven and a new earth. So, I mean, I gave you a thumbnail in about, what, 10 minutes. So, uh, But it's all about Jesus, guys. At the end of the day, when we read about the events and a third of the earth dying and a quarter of the earth dying, it's still all about Jesus. It doesn't matter. It's about Jesus. We keep our eyes on Jesus. You know, so when we look at the book of Revelations, Revelations chapter 1, we see that it's Jesus reintroducing himself to John. And we see that John, when he sees Jesus, melts at his feet. So in chapter 1 is this reintroduction. It's the instruction from God to Jesus and Jesus to John to write what he hears and what he sees and what he experiences. We also see a bunch of names and attributes that are attached to Jesus that will be used in chapter 2 and 3 and throughout the Bible, uh, throughout the book. And then we see when we get to chapter 2 and 3, we see uh, something that I find very interesting is we see the, the, the letters, the opening of these letters. Remember, John's Revelation has seven different intros, and it's going to seven churches in Asia Minor. So he has the Revelation, which is chapter 1, and then chapter 4 through 22, and then he, we see in chapter 2 and 3, he writes seven intros. So to the church at Ephesus, and he writes to that church and its leadership. And, and, and we'll go through that when we go through chapter uh, two. But here's the thing I want you to see. And it really is very profound and it really hit me very hard. 
when we see Jesus just before he leaves the earth, he was very tender with uh, the apostle Peter. Peter had denied him uh, about you know, 45, 40 days prior uh, before his death, burial, and resurrection. Peter denied him three times after being warned. Before Jesus ascends to heaven in John chapter 21, he, or John 20, he restores Peter by pay, telling him, Peter, do you love me? You know, if you love me, you're going to feed my sheep. You're going to teach my sheep. You're going to, uh, you know, you're going to do the work of the ministry. When we see 65 years later, when John is interacting with Jesus, he has a more forceful voice. He has a demanding voice. There's an expectation to the leadership at the seven churches. Either you guys get it right or I'm going to take your church away from you. I'm going to fire you. And it's, I call it a more adult voice. We see that he goes from a very nurturing voice, almost to a young child, to an adult voice. Like, hey, you know better. You've had the Holy Spirit for 65 years. You should know better. You should be getting this stuff right. You shouldn't be living this way. It's things like, I'll spew you out of my mouth. I'll take your church away from you. This was a much more adult voice. This is the voice that should be guiding our, us daily. You know, and so that, that's another uh, point about the book of Revelations. It's the only book in the Bible that opens with a blessing to those that hear it. In fact, it, it, let me just read it. It says, to those that read it, hear it, and keep it. To keep it means to, you know, to uh, cherish it, to uh, retain it, to continue to remember it. Uh, and then it closes with a curse. Anybody that adds to it or subtracts to it will be cursed with all the things in the book. So there's an opening blessing to those and a curse to those. It's written to us, you and me, even though the seven churches receive their intro, the entire revelation is for the entire universal church. From when Jesus was taken up in the book of Acts until he returns. I, you and I can learn from any part of the book. And so we need to learn from every part. Part of the, I think part of the blessing to those that read it, hear it, and keep it is understanding the adult nature, the foreknowledge of God, and the judgment of God. I mean, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, when we read something that Daniel wrote 2,500 years ago, or the book of Revelation, that was written almost 2,000 years ago. And we see God telling us with great detail what's going to happen. And it happens. What does that do? It, one, it builds our faith. Two, it gives us tremendous respect and understanding for the foreknowledge and understanding of God. We can follow him anywhere. We can trust his word anytime. But also, it was given for us specifically for our time period so that we those of us that are alive on earth when he comes, remember it's generation to generation, but there'll be three generations here. There'll be, uh, there'll be a son, a father, and a grandfather, you know, or, or a daughter, a mother, and a grandmother on earth at the time that these events take place. And so the blessing is knowing they're taking place and understanding them. But I think the greatest value is that we learn from it. You know, why did the Ephesian church what was his rebuke to them? What didn't they have right? What am I not doing in my life that I need to change or the Laodicean church? As we'll get into the book, you'll see those things begin to uh, sort of roll out, lay themselves out. You know, when you look at the book, chapter one is the reintroduction of John and Jesus. Two and three are the intros to the seven churches. Chapter 4 is us looking into the throne room of God. There's very few times in the Bible where we see the throne of God. Uh, the others are, uh, Ezekiel is the only other one I think of right now, but we see that there's four seraphim angels around the throne of God. There's 24 elders around the throne of God. John describes the colors and the rainbows and the sea, and, and uh, we see how God is holy in chapter 4. Uh, chapter 5 is about Jesus and how wor worthy he is to open the, the, uh, the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. And 
So we see that the chapter one is the introduction, the intro, John to Jesus, the instructions, write what you hear, see and experience, some of the attributes of Jesus and names of Jesus. Two and three are the intros to the seven churches. Four is the Father God and five is Jesus, right? So six through the end of the book and all of the events and all of the things that happen are built on the Father being holy and Jesus being worthy. When we look at the events, I mean, even though they are catastrophic and can be somewhat scary, he opens a seal and 25% of the earth is, is killed through war, through famine, through pestilence, and through beasts of the field. That's a traumatic event, but it's Jesus that's opening the seal. It's Jesus that's allowing the trumpet. It's Je all of that control is in the hands of Jesus. And it's all happening by God into the earth to slow down Antichrist and to come against Antichrist. When you look back in the Bible, a lot of what happens with the seven seals, seven trumpets, the seven bowls, there are parallels to the time of Moses. Moses worked with God against Pharaoh, a type of Antichrist. And so the Jews knew, Israel knew what was coming. And so not only did they know what there was coming, they could prepare for it, and there were certain protections for them in it. Same thing with us in end times. Even though the events may seem traumatic, they may seem overwhelming, there are gonna be certain protections in the midst of it. Believe me, many of us will be martyred. In fact, it's, it, martyrdom is a huge part of this. Um, and uh, there's a reason for it. We're gonna go through it with great detail you know, again, as we get into the book. And so when you look at, at what, we've, what we've talked about, it's really important to understand that what's really happening is a man, the firstborn, the first fruits, Jesus, is gonna return and execute judgment on Antichrist, the false prophet, the great harlot, uh, all of the unsaved, and is going to, as a man, become king of the entire earth. And we are going to rule and reign with him together forever. And so it's vital that we understand it's about the man Jesus. It's all about him. At the end of the day, who cares about the seven seals trumpet? When those are happening, we only have two or three years left. I mean, there's no, there's no time left. It's great tribulation. You know, we're either going to go to heaven and watch it from heaven, or we're going to live here navigating through the storms between Antichrist trying to kill us and eradicate us from the earth and the judgments of God coming on the earth. Some of us are going to be martyred by Antichrist. Some of us are going to be martyred because God called us to an area that's going to be destroyed to try and bring souls into the kingdom of God. It's all about Jesus. We need to be eternally minded and love not our lives even unto the death. You know, and so with that, I want to keep these to about a half hour. So we're at we're about 23 minutes. So let's read uh, verses 1 through 3. So uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants. So immediately, the revelation of Jesus Christ it's God's revelation of what's going to happen. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the entire book is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, to Jesus, to show us, his servants, those things which must shortly come to pass. He sent and signified it by his angels and to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things he saw, blessed is he who reads and those that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. Again, the entire book is about Jesus, the revelation of Jesus, because it's not about the events, it's not about Antichrist, it's not about false prophet, the great harlot. It's the most robust version of Jesus. In the Old Testament, we see things about who Jesus is was going to be, who he was going to be, what he was going to do. We've seen that 
you know, Isaiah tells us he shall grow up like a tender root. There's nothing about him that we should desire him. That, that, he, that he would be executed and killed. We see that in the book of I, in, in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah and the other uh, scriptures that, that point to him. It's called shadow Christology. It points to Jesus. Then in the Gospels, we see the man. We see the man on earth empowered by the Holy Spirit walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we see him revealing the Father, revealing a new way to live. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. In the New Testament, if you even think on a woman, you've committed adultery. There's a whole new bar being set. There's a whole new revelation. But by and large, we see Jesus for who he was as the man. In the epistles, we see Jesus for what he did for us. We learned who we are, what belongs to us. We learned that we're a new creation. We learned that we're saved, we're saved, you know, uh, by grace through faith we learned you know how to live how to pray we learned uh, many many different things through the epistles but when we get to the book of revelation we see the most robust version of who jesus is today we see who he is before the throne of god he is the alpha and the omega the first and the last you know he is uh, all of the names and attributes that we'll see in the scriptures so the Father gave this revelation to Jesus to give to us his covenant partners, to give to us his bride. And so John receives this, and in the book, in the entire book, we're going to see either Jesus uh, telling John, angels, four beasts around the throne of God, which are essentially their angels, seraphim angels, telling John, we see angels also explaining to John. John is seeing a 3D open vision. So he's actually seeing these things happen. So when, when, when John, as we go on here, sees Jesus, he's actually physically seeing him. When he sees a seal open and he sees something happen on the earth, he's seeing a 3D movie. He's in the movie, so he's seen it. So he's going to tell him to write those things down. Now, when he says there's a blessing to those that hear and see, when you keep the book, it means that you take the book seriously, you live in awe of the revelation of it. You cherish and protect it in your heart and your memory. You love the book and you embrace it. You watch for the signs and the generation that's alive when things unfold. That generation, is, it's like Moses again living through it the voice in revelation is much different you know so so here we see you know god really god is really telling jesus jesus is telling john and so john's writing these words in other words when john writes the first three verses it's because jesus is dictating it to him and so we see again when we read that the revelation of jesus christ which god gave uh him to show us, you and me, his servants, things that must shortly come to pass. It's been 2,000 years. It's even closer now. He sent and signified it by his angels to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God, to the testimony of Jesus, all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things that are written in it, for the time is near. Amen. We're going to end there. We're about 30 minutes. We're going to do these every Thursday. We're going to go verse by verse. I'm sending out one set of notes. So when you get them, print them. Uh, and then we'll post these on Thursdays. And then every Thursday, you'll receive a new teaching to the same note. So I, it's going to be chapter by chapter. So you're going to receive orienta orientation in chapter 1 should have received it already print it don't throw it away we're not going to re-email it i want to cut down on the emails everyone's getting i don't want to annoy anyone who's not participating but you'll be able to if you don't see it uh, on you know if you don't um, uh, have the notes you threw them away you'll be able to get them on our website under go to the teaching section in the teaching section you'll see tuesday saturday 
headline and prophecy, and you'll also see our verse by verse or line by line, we're calling this. Uh, you'll be able to get the notes there. So uh, this will be coming out. And again, I'll do these every Thursday. They'll be about a half hour in length. And so it'll probably take us uh, two more weeks to get through chapter one. Again, we're gonna take our time going through it. It's not an exhaustive study, and it, but it is, a, it is, we're gonna go verse by verse. And when we get to areas where I think it's really important for us to understand, we'll spend more time there in areas where I don't think we need to really understand. Um, you know, we'll, we'll move on through those fairly quickly. But at the end of this, in the notes will be the book itself. So you don't need your Bible. You they print the notes, you'll have the verses and the commentary. So that's meant to, you can put this in a binder and you'll have a workbook for the book of Revelations. After this, I, I'm praying about, I may do the book of Galatians, or I may go and do with the book of Daniel. But we'll continue every Thursday to do a line-by-line, verse-by-verse teaching. So God bless you, and I'll see you next time.